Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day four of the EXA conference. Um, I'm Simone Rufinat. I'm part of the EXA headquarters team, and I'm the project officer for DNOSIS and will be chairing this session this morning. So welcome to this workshop on the highly inclusive DNOSIS methodology that tackles social environmental issues using citizen science. Um, before I start introducing the speakers, I would like to just um, mention something, um, a housekeeping issue. Um, so if I could get uh, the shared screen, please. Perfect. Thank you very much. So there's been two conference has hashtags being used on Twitter uh, the last couple of days. Um, and there's actually the EXA 2020 hashtag is also used by another association that has a conference. So uh, to make sure that the, the threads don't get too messy, um, if I can ask you from now on to maybe use the hashtag SITSI 2020, please. Um, so that's just a short announcement. Um, so we'll get to the workshop. Um, this workshop was actually um, thought to be a discussion in smaller groups, if we could meet in Trieste. Um, so we can uh, share our Dinosis methodology with you, and we can also discuss on how this can be potentially used in your projects or approaches. And um, the aim was to pass on our lessons learned. So now online, we changed it a little bit. Um, so we will present our inclusive methodology and the tools with lots of examples and also pass on our main lessons learned. Um, but please add comments and questions in the chat throughout the entire workshop. Um, and I also add the comments about your projects, how you ensure inclusiveness in your project and how you think maybe what you hear today can also help with your engagement in your project. Um, so we'll try to come back to these comments at the end. Uh, of the workshop and uh, we'll also move to Zoom after this workshop during the coffee break um, to have uh, more discussions face to face with you. So if you're interested in continuing, please come to Zoom as well. Um, and they will also have a community champion, one of our citizen scientists um, telling her story uh, in this project. Uh, we'll stop for questions at some point in the middle as well. So please write your questions at any time in the public chat. Um, and we'll also have a question session in the end. Um, and Rosa Arias will be monitoring the public chat as well. She's the coordinator of this project. Um, so she's on the other side of this broadcast and she will be answering a few straightforward questions in the chat. Um, so if there are any, uh, please keep an eye out on her answers as well. Um, if I can get the slide up again, please. Yes, perfect. So you can see a photo of Rosa on the left if you haven't met her yet. Um, and we'll be using Menti, uh, Mentimeter throughout our presentation as well for a couple of questions to get your uh, thoughts on a few things. Um, so please make sure you're ready to, um, to open Menti and to answer questions. Uh, we will be sharing the, the direct link to the Menti uh, page on the public chat, but there will also be the code displayed on, on the specific slides. So you can either use the code or the direct link. Okay, I would like to introduce the speakers now. Um, so we've got Nora Salasioan. She's um, worked, she works at Ibercivis, um, which is the coordinating partner in this project. Uh, Ibercivis is a nonprofit foundation that promotes the concept of citizen science, implements citizen science projects, and also provides technical support. So, for example, in the EU CITSAI project, um, they're doing all the tech. Um, second, we've got Lucia Irandanea. She works at Ideas for Change, also in Barcelona, like Iber Civis. Um, and Ideas for Change is a consulting and a research company that focuses on innovation with impact. And they're specialized in design of open and contributory business models, as well as the development of citizen participation strategies. And last but not least, we've got Maria Alonso. She's from Mapping for Change in London. Um, and it's a social enterprise that's partly owned by the University College London. Maybe some of you have seen um, the poster presentation by Louise Francis yesterday. Um, and uh, Mapping for Change aims to empower individuals and communities to make a difference to their local area through the use of mapping and geographical information. So all three very central to the DNOSIS methodology. And as I'm also part of the DNOSIS project, I will start uh, with the introduction to this workshop as well and to the project. 
Uh, so first, I will tell you a little bit about the Dinosis project, so we're all on the same page. Um, then Nora will tell you about the inclusiveness uh, engagement model, um, and also start with the example of Barcelona, the pilot study in Barcelona. Lucia will then take over and tell you more about uh, the example and some, some details. And Maria, in the end, will tell you about some stories about inclusiveness and some really important lessons that we learned. And after this workshop, we will move to the Zoom discussion where you can hear from our community champions. And to start off, I would like to show you a video. It's a short three minute video about the project that gives you a really, uh, really good um, introduction to it. So if I can please get the video played. Thank you. There are several activities like refineries, uh, like hotels, restaurants, coffees, the you know, sanitario, and we have a case study. It's mm -hmm. about a river. It's very polluted. Chemical industry, wastewater treatment installations, people urinating in the street, la industria pesquera, sus productos de origen animal. It affects their lives in their uh, houses. The smell uh, causes headaches, problems with the eyes, problems with the throats skin issues, allergies, it affects the life of the children with have occasions where schools are closed. The problem with photos is that they are very difficult to measure. It's not like noise that you have a sonometer and you can say very easily if you comply or not with the regulations, but with others, what is the parameter that you can use to regulate? Dinosis is a highly ambitious project that wants to tackle other pollution by using citizen science. Traditionally, others are measured in the laboratory by dynamical factometry using the human nose as sensor to estimate the other concentration. However, we can evaluate the impact, but we cannot know the real perception, the real nuisance that citizens are perceiving on the streets. Citizens are experts of their own lives, of their own neighborhoods. So this is a fabulous opportunity for people to contribute all their measurements to address the problem and possibly have amazing impact in a situation that is really hard to control at the moment. In Dinosis, for the first time, citizens will work together with the industries, the local authorities and the other experts to co-design local solutions and increase the quality of life in the affected area. We will create the communities, provide training to the affected citizens and gather real-time other observations using other collects. The data collected will be validated by the other experts and from there we will set the foundations for new regulations on other pollution. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so the video gives you a really short introduction and it also features a lot of our project partners. So you see uh, the variety of, um, of our consortium as well. Um, if I can get the slides up again, please. Perfect. So as you've heard, you know, odor pollution um, is the central topic of this um, project. And odor pollution is actually a huge issue. It is the second cause for um, second largest cause for environmental complaints. Um, it can affect the quality of life of people, and it's very very difficult to measure. Um, and so, even good smells and also bad smells can actually lead to nuisance. So, odor pollution is not just about bad smells. It can also be good smells as in a chocolate factory, for example, if you live right next to it and are exposed to it all the time, it can become a nuisance. Um, auto monitoring methods are very expensive. 
um, they're quite inefficient and there's a long process to it. And there's no information about nuisance in any of those monitoring methods, which makes it really difficult to, um, to monitor the levels of odor and how people are affected by it. And there are disparate regulations throughout Europe. So many countries actually don't have any regulations at all about odors. Um, and if their regulations, they're different from area to area, from country to country, there is no regulation on the EU level at the moment. So the DNOSES approach um, uh, tackles the, the odor pollution issue through citizen science. And uh, sorry, just trying, yeah. Um, and so there's no, no better sensor than the human nose. It's actually, it's the best sensor there is in this world. Uh, no machine can actually do it any better. Um, and so we try to enable the citizens to monitor the odors themselves. So in the areas they actually live in, the areas they know best. Um, and we use accessible online tools. So everything is, um, is done as easily as possible for everyone to understand and to use. The advantages of this approach is that it's very cost effective. It's accessible to everyone. It enables the identification of patterns of odor episodes across space and time, and so that we get real-time measurements of, of odor episodes. And it enables the identification of potential sources as well. Often the odors are around, but the sources are unknown. So it's a good, um, it's a good method for that as well. Thank you. The principle 10 is central to the DNOS methodology. Uh, it states that uh, citizens should be included in handling environmental issues and that public awareness and participation should be encouraged through making information openly accessible. And this is really central to DNOS as we try to make um, access to information as easy as possible. We encourage public participation in all kinds of ways and we try to achieve environmental justice. The sustainable development goals are also <laughs> central, um, and especially the ones uh, about good health and well-being, sustainable communities, and the partnership SDG. So uh, the leave no one behind, basically, as was nicely stated on Monday in the SDG session. And within our project, we have the quadruple helix model. So this is basically our way of leaving no one behind. The quadruple helix model includes um, citizens, citizen associations on the one hand, on the other hand, academics and other experts. And then there's also the industries, the SMEs, the emitting uh, industries, for example. And we also have the local governments and uh, municipalities, uh, regulatory authorities. And within the project consortium, we actually have partners from all four of these um, quadruple helix stakeholder groups. So even within our consortium, we are we left no one behind. And as you heard in the video, we are trialing the method uh, in 10 pilot studies. Most of them, so eight of them are in Europe. It is a European project, so most of them are in Europe. But we also have um, one case study in, um, in Chile and one in Uganda. So we start uh, locally with our case studies with those specific communities in those different areas. Um, and we provide them with the tools they need uh, to measure the odors and to start making change. Uh, but we go up to the global scale. So all our tools are actually available on a global scale. We have the Odor Observatory, for example, which um, is a platform that uh, gives information um, you can find all kinds of information about odor, about odor pollution, about um, different case studies and uh, everything like that. So it's a platform that gives you lots of information and it's available in many different languages as well to make it as inclusive as possible. Then we have the community maps, which you can see on the bottom left. Um, those are actually, um, a, it's a multilingual responsive web app. It visualizes geospatial data and it actually enables the creation of bespoke maps. So you can create any kind of map. And within the project, if used community maps, um, map communities affected by odors. So there are maps that you can have a look at to see where people are actually affected by odors. There are other maps where you can look at odor regulations in different countries and areas. And then we've even used them to map odor memories in one of the pilots that we have. 
And uh, the AutoCollect app, which was also mentioned in the video, is um, an app that is also available on a global scale. Uh, it can be used by anyone to map odors uh, in their area. And it's a real-time uh, odor measurement device or tool. And we've also um, done lots of policy and we're starting our advocacy um, work as well. So on the right, you can see our policy brief introducing the issue of odor pollution. And so our policy and advocacy efforts go beyond the local level. So we do a lot on the national and also the international, so the EU level. And we're advocating for better or new regulations regarding odors if they are. So now we get to the inclusive engagement model. So I would like to pass on to Nora for this part. Thank, Thank you, you very Nora. much. Or is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, for this nice introduction. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. So I will present you the Denosive Inclusive Engagement Model. So next slide, please, thanks. Uh, this model is largely based on previous engagement models from Partners Ideas for Change, the Bristol approach, and Mapping for Change. We also adhere ourselves with Extreme Citizen Science approach from the Excites Group at UCL by Hackley. And we are adapting this model to the 10 pilot case studies that Simon mentioned, uh, not, to be, um, not to be used as a prescriptive model, but a useful guide that can uh, accompany the pilots in their engagement strategies in, in all the different contexts. So we are also starting the evaluation of this model now, and we hope uh, this model can be also useful um, uh, to engage um, other social environmental issues across the globe, um, in particular, taking into account uh, the local needs of the people. So we do not understand the model as a linear approach. Uh, so there are many iterations occurring among the phases. So I will just explain you briefly um, how, how we intend to do it. So first of all, we want to identify the issues. So are there any other issues in the area affecting communities? Uh, in the second phase, uh, we ask ourselves which stakeholders, if we have identified this issue, are and should be involved, how to engage them. From here, I will explain later, but we build a stakeholder map and we start with stakeholder recruitment uh, following the quadruple helix model that Simon mentioned before. So then we go into the third phase, which is frame the problem. So how can we better understand the problem? Uh, we set the initial priorities here and depend on the historical, social, others, technical knowledge, and, and the local context, which is very crucial for us. So in the fourth phase, pilot design, uh, we ask ourselves, how can the pilot help to improve the other issue? Which data needs to be gathered and how? Which skills are needed? Uh, from here, we run co-creation actions with key stakeholders uh, in order to build a common agenda that, as you can imagine, um, it's not easy if we want to engage industries, uh, citizens, uh, local authorities and researchers at the same time. So the fifth phase is data collection. So we want to deploy a data collection protocol and, and gather data um, with the stakeholders identified to then go on to data analysis. So what does the data tell us? Um, we hope uh, to get to the seventh phase, which is action. So which solutions can we co-create with all these stakeholders to tackle the other problem and look for improvements? Um, and last, uh, it's the outcomes phase. So here we want to reflect on the process, the outcomes, uh, and the policies common. So next slide, please. So one of the crucial characteristics of our model is to be highly inclusive. So we want to include people affected by the other issues, regardless of social realities, social cultural background, socioeconomic status, age, gender, literacy levels. We understand that uh, everybody in, a, in an area that is affected by others um, can, can participate and can have a voice. Uh, to tackle the issue. Everyone has a nose also, as Simon was saying. So in order to do so, 
we try to check our inclusion levels, we can say within each phase. So we have created some tools for the partners to, to ensure that um, inclusive is met in engagement actions. So for example, um, ensure that all social groups affected by the problem are represented. Uh, for this, we always have to adapt our engagement strategies and tools, mind the language, identify less vocal groups, amongst others. So once we have got the model, which is like the theory, uh, how do we get the people? <laughs> That's the tricky, the tricky phase. So we want to share with you the example of Barcelona. Um, Barcelona is a pioneer pilot of the project. Um, in the forum area. Uh, the affected area is located, as you see in the map, in the northeast side of the city uh, by the coastline, uh, one of the city ends. Uh, next to there, there's another city that is called San Adria, which is also affected by others. So in terms of engagement, uh, it has been very interesting as this is a very complex area with a diversity of social realities to which we uh, have needed to adapt and be very flexible uh, to engage everybody, as, as I was saying, explaining the model. So the forum area has suffered from a historical problem. Uh, there's multiple sources of odors at the same place, um, treating most of the ways of the city. Uh, so you can imagine that the others are not pleasant at all. Um, we choose this pilot um, because of this uh, complexity in terms of the emitting sources and in terms of engagement. And we also choose this pilot uh, because we had um, technical knowledge on others uh, by Rosa Arias working in the area before, and also because uh, we hoped for a feasible collaboration with the regional authority, which we tried to include in the Dinosis Advisory Board, and, and, and they are within the project. Uh, because they manage most of the other emitting activities. So we thought this could uh, ensure that change would happen in the area. So just uh, um, a little story here. Uh, the forum area uh, is called Forum now because in 2004, uh, there, were, uh, there was a, a big event called the Forum of the Cold, but I think it had to happen in many cities uh, in the world, and then I think it was not very successful, so it happened just twice, if I don't recall badly. So this is a, a funny campaign that happened at the time, and actually, um, for those who are not familiar with Catalan, uh, Ferum in Catalan is uh, nuisance, is bad odors, so this tried to be a, a protest against uh, a big polemic on the speculation that took part uh, in that moment as uh, real estate agent agencies created high standard buildings with apartments, a big shopping mall, a nice park. So the area changed so much and a new neighborhood appeared um, with this event. Uh, but then also, um, there were uh, a lot of social disadvantages for a lot of people who was living there that had to move. Uh, you can imagine a little bit, and and the sign is, is funny because um, so it play it plays with the word forum, uh, playing it with forum, which is about others. Next, please. Uh, so yeah, just to show you a photo of the area. So you see some. Nice views with the coastline, the sea, some boats, some refurbished area. But as you can see, there's uh, these uh, all multiple other emitting sources. Uh, there's the ways and wastewater treatment facilities, sludge treatment plants, incinerators uh, that treat most of the waste of the city. So they are all, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Uh, they are all here. So you can imagine that, that um, it's difficult to inhabit uh, being so close with 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 all these plans. Next. So in terms of engagement, uh, just to show you also what I was uh, saying, um, you can see the differences and the contrast between the new area created uh, from 2004 with new, with new buildings, boats. You can see at the end um, some of the, some of the meeting industries uh, in the photo at the left-hand side at the top. Uh, but then uh, there's also um, there's also a very disadvantaged neighborhood, as you can see in the photos below, which is called Lamina, um, um, 
which if you are if you were born in Barcelona and you were little you never wouldn't dare to go there I mean it was like I don't know um, it's 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 a very stigmatized neighborhood you never would go there uh, you have heard about uh, murders drugs uh, etc and so that's that's the contrast and as you can imagine we had to adapt a lot in terms of engagement to be able to 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 get to the people there that is also affected by others so just a hint on on the historical background of of, of the area so this neighborhood um where the forum area is so these photos uh, are where the forum area is so so the photos that you've seen uh, before. So in the 20s, um, this neighborhood emerged to take migrants from other parts of Spain that came to work uh, for the Universal Exhibition of Barcelona. So in the 60s, um, the population were mainly from the gypsy community with around 700 shacks, and in the 70s with nearly 3,000 people living there in very poor conditions. So the neighborhood was uh, starting to be demolished at the end of the 80s, and most of the people went to live in La Mina, in this neighborhood that I was mentioning before. So this is one of the poorest areas of Barcelona. So uh, how, how did we start engaging the people? So uh, we're going in, on to the second phase now, stakeholder mapping. So we identified uh, the other emitting industries. We identified uh, communities, the public sector, uh, the research um, institutions that we wanted to engage. Uh, and we, we did an exercise that has proved very useful for us. So we uh, mapped potential motivations and barriers for these stakeholders to be engaged. And uh, we built theoretically uh, mitigation strategies. So that helped us very much uh, in the real life when we had to engage. Next. So then we go on to the frame the problem phase. Um, we had some meetings uh, with the regional authority, uh, which, as I said, manages most of the plans. Uh, we also started meetings with the citizen association, IRENET. Uh, we will have uh, a representative of IRENET um, after in the Zoom uh, debate. Um, so if, we, if you want to hear uh, her, her experience, it will be possible. Um, so this association includes more than 50 different associations and we, we got to know that they were very active in the issue. So we started uh, meetings with them to frame the problem. And then we, we, we did some visits with the meeting industries to better understand the problem. So now uh, I would like to pose you a question uh, using Mentimeter. So please um, get menti.com ready in your phones or in your laptops and enter the code. So the question I would like to pose you here is, uh, once we got here, uh, where would you start engaging the stakeholders? Which stakeholders would you engage first? Would you talk first with the regional authority? Uh, or either would you go to the citizen association and you would start talking with the citizens about the issue, um, not having talked with the regional authority before. Would you go to the industries first to see what, what they think uh, they are doing in terms of causing others in the area? Um, I just want to say that there's not a right answer, so please just guess, and, and I would um, just tell you what we did. And, and continue with the story. Um, I know I have to leave some time for you to answer. Hope you are adding your answers now. So three different possibilities. Start with the regional authority. Uh, second, start uh, engaging the citizens within the association. And third, start uh, talking with the emitting industries. So let's see if we can see some, some results here from the poll. Yeah, they're coming up. Okay, so most of the people um, would engage the citizen association first. 
uh, actually a big majority of, of the people who voted. And then I see, okay. So then I see uh, some of the people um, voted the regional authority and not, uh, authority and not many, uh, so just one, I guess, yeah. Um, the other emitting industries. Great. I would love to hear from you and your opinions on this, but maybe we can just discuss later in the chat. Uh, so I will tell you what we did. Actually, uh, it was not easy to decide. And we had also kind of internal discussions within, within the team because um, we thought that uh, as you voted, as most of you voted, it was uh, right to involve first the citizens. Uh, but we came with the decision that uh, it would be good to have first the regional authority on board because um, they are managing most of the plants and, and the meeting industries. And we really wanted, um, so our, our desire, our aim with the pilot uh, was to improve uh, the others in the area. And we thought uh, that this was crucial in order uh, for change to happen in that sense, in, in, in an area that has suffered historically from this problem. So, um, obviously, then we, we started engaging the citizens also, but first of all, we wanted to have the regional authority um, on board. So, yeah, just, just to tell you some of the barriers that we encounter here. So, with the regional authority, uh, we had many concerns and fear at the beginning. Uh, they were talking in the first meetings. Uh, they, they, they couldn't see uh, uh, that we were uh, going to disseminate a map with a lot of dots. Uh, with bad others in the area, so they were very afraid on this. Um, we also encounter many deficiencies uh, from the CSO, because as I told you, it's a historical problem. So they just thought that uh, we might be uh, another project just promising solutions with little effect. And then um, we found deficiencies uh, from the industries to share any data available, and actually we are still facing problems with this. Um, so just... Um, so the stakeholder map uh, exercise that I was telling you before helped us um, to have arguments and, and, and build dialogue um, towards these barriers. So we were presenting a innovative scientific methodology based on previous successful initiatives uh, from the other side and, and from the citizen science and engagement side. So um, for us, it was crucial to show that we were involving all actors from the quadruple helix, promoting dialogue and transparency. That, uh, so we wanted to build a common agenda uh, where everybody could be including. So that could strengthen the relationships amongst actors uh, in a community that um, it's uh, still fighting for, for solving this problem. So what did we do um, to start engaging the citizens, the communities? So we went where the community is. Uh, actually, uh, I think Lucia and myself moved to the forum area for a while. <laughs> we could have rented an apartment there uh, for some time. Uh, so we started to visit uh, all the associations that we found. Uh, we started to speak with everybody. Um, we went to the businesses. Uh, we went to the historical archive in, in La Mina, which is an amazing um, historical place um, that shows uh, all that happened in the neighborhood. We hear stories from everybody. Um, uh, we use ethnographic fieldwork. So we use uh, participant observation. Um, we were discussing about this yesterday. So as a means to um, participate and, and, and treat the, the citizens as active subjects and try to understand the realities and their local needs uh, to be able to build uh, a project um, where they could feel as, as, as you know, as, as their project also, they could feel ownership and we could build together something to improve the situation. Next. So here we started to, to really recruit people that was interested to, to participate uh, in the project. So we participated uh, also in some programs in Radio Lamina, which was very interesting. Um, 
we started to know more about where the people was experiencing the others. Uh, we were um, involving ourselves in community events that were uh, happening in the areas you can see in the pictures. We mapped um, a lot of places where people uh, was, were gathering. Uh, so we were learning a lot about uh, where to find the people. So for instance, uh, uh, for start recruiting um, mums um, in the in, in La Mina, for example, I just it just happened that uh, we visited the gym and we saw that most of the families were there from five to six in the afternoon waiting for their children that were uh, having their swimming courses. So there was a bar there, so we were taking advantage of the bar and we were going there speaking to everybody. Um, that has been our approach. So just you know, uh, go where the people is and just. And just to give a final message of my talk, uh, this seems very nice, but it's not easy at all. So engagement is hard, it needs time, it's uh, human resources consuming, and I think uh, it's, an amazing, uh, it's an amazing thing to do, but it needs time and it needs resources. So hopefully all the projects that um, go uh, for, for this kind of engagement can have the, the needed time and the resources um, just to carry on a good, a good one. So thank you so much. Uh, we will pose you another question, but I will pass, uh, I will give the floor to my colleague Lucia that will continue with, with the story. So thank you so much. Okay, so there's a the direct link to the Mentimeter in the public chat. Uh, so you can use that or the code. And then Lucia will um, take up the answer and continue from here. Lucia. Okay, so I will I will I will do that. I will I will just pose a question then. So from here, uh, what would you do next? So if you can go again to menti.com and guess uh what what is the next step in in this uh, exciting pilot case study in barcelona what did we do after uh identifying the issue uh, understanding the context uh mapping the stakeholders framing the problem what is next what what did we do next Maybe there's, are there some technical problems on this? Okay. So Lucia should go on now, it's her part. So if the control room can please put Lucia on and uh, share the slides as well. Great, thanks. Is Lucia, Lucia is around, right? <laughs> anyway, I can just, I can just, uh, ah, Lucia is coming. Okay. Hi, Hi. there she is. I'm here. Here. <laughs> we found okay. you. Okay. <laughs> yes, I was lost for a minute, but now I'm here. So um, thank you very much for participating. I'm very, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So as you might said, I'm not sure I would work out. Um, yes, that's what exactly uh, what we did. We, we weren't short about uh, the methodology because it was a novel one. Um, so what we did was to, um, to, to deploy a beta pilot. This is uh, a beta pilot is a, a really small, in a really small scale um, pilot uh, going through all the phases in a really fast way. We had like one month of beta pilot and we test uh, the methodology and the technology that uh, it was uh, also new. This beta pilot allow us to test the engagement methods to improve and adapt adapt the training materials and the mobile app developed for the project in the wild. 
um, this, this was with real people in real context that we could test a short amount of time in a short amount of time, almost all the steps of our methodology and to adapt and inform the whole process. Um, if you go to the next one, please. So what we did was to uh, have this uh, in, a, in a really, as I said, in a really uh, fast way, uh, the whole process of the pilot. So we did like four uh, workshops. Uh, the first one was to understand the problem and frame the problem. The second one was to train on other training and uh, to, to, uh, to uh, make sure that the other a collect app that it was the, the like the, the app that we would use. Um, it was uh, it was understandable and all the things that uh, we we should uh, do. Um, in the in the we we didn't do like a, a workshop between the data collection and the data analysis because we wanted to uh, have yeah, first-hand interviews with the participants to gather their feedback around the app. Uh, on the third workshop, we had uh, data analysis um, with like a small amount of, of data that we had collected uh, in two weeks. Uh, but uh, it was suit for us and it was really useful to understand uh, like the data, uh, the app, and all uh, the things that might be wrong. Um, and but the final workshop was uh, a co-design of next actions for the pilot. Um, so with all this uh, really fast beta pilot, we could uh, um, go to the, the fourth phase that, that is uh, the pilot design. And this pilot design, um, was uh, informed by this beta pilot uh, because we we weren't sure about this uh, this methodology and, and this app. We uh, we had all this. We gather all this feedback from the community champions about the the the, all, the whole method. So a new strategy co-created uh, with them was ready. Uh, and uh, for example, we had some. Um, some changes from the regional strategy. Uh, for example, uh, the first one was uh, that we wanted to have one centralized pilot, but after their input, we uh, realized and decided together with them that we have to decentralize the strategy in different neighborhoods. Because the reflection was uh, that despite being uh, the same forum area, as Nora said, uh, the, the neighborhoods were very different and we couldn't have one single spot and one single uh, strategy for them. Also, we, um, we uh, decided not to, um, not to have, uh, um, like, create new events, uh, but to build upon the existing ones, the ones that uh, the community uh, create and deploy, and they was very important for them. For example, here we have with Nora in a in a event uh, in the winter was uh, it was really really cold, but uh, many people came and uh, could uh, understand like the project. And actually, we had a lot of participants from this event. And uh, yeah, it was it was the best strategy for this. And if you go to this other one, please, Maria. So um, the other thing that happened is, was as I said, uh, we train people on other recognitions and use the app. Uh, we uh, deployed a lot of sensory walks um, to train people on other recognition. And also we had informal meetings to uh, gather more participants and attract more people. Um, in, in, in the middle of this, we uh, create uh, materials for them to be on board. Uh, for example, we had this um, material like user guide for the other collect app that was created and delivered for in different hotspots in the foreign area uh, to, to um, try to get on board 
with uh, the people. And for the last one, if, if you can go, Maria, please. Also, we, as we said, we have a lot of feedback uh, around the other Collect app uh, regarding functionalities and features. Um, of course, it was our new technology, so always uh, you have to iterate uh, a lot of times. So one of the things that uh, we, we could um, improve uh, where, for example, uh, we introduced new type of other. There was something that uh, people were asking. Uh, for example, they they wanted to have not only bad others; they wanted to have also good others, a uh, type of others. Because you would say, like, yes, of course, we have. Um, it smells bad sometimes, but also it smells good. So I don't want to let my neighborhood only smell bad, <laughs> right? Um, uh, for example, other thing that happened it was that, that we could um, adapt and introduce a new language it was Catalan that here for Barcelona was really important um, and it was asked. Um, we also developed a sensory diary for non-digital participants. Um, as you might know, uh, the methodology uh, like try to to foster inclusiveness. So um, we we didn't want to uh, left uh, people behind uh, only with a digital app. So uh, we create this sensory diary for non-digital participants. Mm, in our case, it didn't work very well. Uh, like in in our pilot, only one person used it. But in other cases, for example, the Chile uh, pilot, it was crucial for them because they didn't have much um, internet. So in the last one, the next one, please, Maria. Ah, yes, sorry. Uh, so uh, during the data collection, because after uh, all these um, efforts to attract people and to um, make the base of participants bigger, we uh, could collect 400 uh, 80 other observations gathered with the other collect app in the forum area during 12 months, like one year. Um, we have learned, one, one of the things that we have learned is that 12 months is a lot of time to keep people engaged. And this was shown uh, at the data. So the frequency uh, of other observation have varied depending on the engagement action. It was like peaks. Uh, when we uh, were in events or we when we did uh, sensory walks. Um, so having like a, a really um, frequent uh, observations in one time uh, period is, uh, is well, it's, it was a challenge. And also um, it was uh, the, the intense, uh, like, also, the, the frequency was uh, related with the episodes that happened in the area. So it was like this, these two things that uh, we have learned uh, regarding data collection. And after this year, we have analyzed. So the second one, the, 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 yes. So we, we have to go to the, the, like the next phase that is the analyze. But before this, we want to ask you, um, what would you do with the data? In my experience, uh, people is very um, keen of gathering data, but when uh, they have to decide what to do with the data, that when uh, like the problem starts, <laughs> because uh, it's, it's like when you have a lot of data gathered in this uh, in this time period, and then you have to do. Uh, something like it was crucial. So it's, um, it's, well, it's a challenge. So what would you do with the data? If you go to menti.com and enter the code um, 4329271, you will have like three options, like create, uh, the first one is create a detailed report to share with local authority. 
The second one is organized workshop with citizens to analyze the data. And the last one is consult experts and I mean the industry. So if you have. So of course there is no um, right answer. Everything is permitted because uh, it's all research and we are all um, learning. So, perfect. So some of, like most of you uh, said that organized workshop with citizens uh, to analyze the data. Uh, and in like less people <laughs> say like uh, consult experts and only two create a data report to share with the local authority. Well, in our case, we did, we check all the boxes. <laughs> we did everything. Well, we are doing everything. Uh, so what we have here is a data analysis, a preliminary data analysis, um, that it was really, um, really good to see uh, all the things that we, we have been doing with also with the people. So the data collectors shown, the data collected shown that most reported others by citizens correspond to the other emission activities in the area. That was like water, uh, wastewater uh, treatment plant. That is what the type of other was wastewater uh, with the 52% and waste that 20, 26%. I don't know if you remember, but uh, Nora said that we have like this concentration in the foreign area of uh, other emitting industries. One of uh, one of them is uh, the the um, waste uh, water treatment plant, and the other one was like the waste plant. So these percentages were consistent through all the data collection. This this one this uh, one period uh, time, and also what we find what we found it was that. Uh, Something that citizens suggested at the beginning of the pilot that was that, was that uh, the other episodes in growth incre uh, increase, sorry, increased at night. So possibly because uh, the activities uh, that um, are done in the night uh, by the emitting industry. For example, um, one of the things that uh, they said that it was that at night at eight. Um, some trucks uh, leave the facilities with uh, slash that is uh, uh, that smells really really bad, and this was um, possibly correspond uh, of it was uh, because uh, the elder of the episodes. So uh, what's next? Uh, we are in the final fight phases of the pilot. We have shared with the community this preliminary data analysis, and we want to correlate this data with the ones from the industrial operations uh, to find ways to improve uh, the other pollution. This, this, this is not an easy task, um, but it was uh, approved by the regional authority that we can uh, have, or we can create uh, a gro uh, working group uh, with the wastewater plant and the waste plant to correlate, uh, correlate this data. And all this information will be shared with the community and reflect in a report uh, to the community as part of the action phase. After this, we will decide together the final action. So we are in this phase uh, that we are entering in the action phase uh, so you will, we, you, will ha you will have to wait to see the final results of this pilot. But um, yeah, we are, we are doing it. So uh, I think that this is uh, all. If you have questions, I know that you have, uh, you ha you have been very active in the, in the chat. Um, so uh, maybe Simon, if you want to, or Maria. Yeah, thank you, Lucia. I, there were actually a lot of questions and a lot of discussion in the chat. So 
Um, I think at this point, I might ask a couple of questions before we move on to the lessons learned. Um, uh, let me check. So um, there was a lot of discussion around the quadruple helix model. So lots of people who would like to know more about it. Um, there were some links shared as well. As I said, Rosa is in the chat and I saw that also um, Louise and Hannah also from the Dinosis project are quite active uh, in sharing uh, deliverables and links and papers. Uh, so there were quite a few things shared there, but is there anything uh, Lucia, you or maybe Nora would like to add or elaborate on about the quadruple helix model? Okay, okay, I, I will I will go. <clears throat> the quadruple helix, um, I, I don't know the question. Can, can you read me the question? Um, yeah, so it was just about, you know, I'm very interested in this quadruple helix. Can I find uh, more info on that? And then other people were saying, yes, I would like to know that too. So it, it was less of a question, more like, can I know a bit more about it? <laughs> yeah. ah, perfect, perfect. Well, this is a very interesting thing from the Dinosis project. Um, the quadruple helix wants to um, include uh, different actors, stakeholders from the experts, uh, from the academy, from the um, uh, regional authorities or political authorities, or the local um, in um, the local industries and the citizens all together to co-create uh, this kind of uh, this kind of research uh, projects. Um, so we we aim to. Um, gather all this all to include in all the methodology all these uh, stakeholders because we we really believe that uh only with them we can't have uh real improvements in the quality of flight and and so on so um i don't know if you know that wants to add something Yeah, so I think one of the questions uh, was related re related to the first uh, Mentimeter, so who to engage first. And as I said, uh, that was not an easy en endeavor. Actually, we had uh, many uh, internal discussions about this because we didn't know what was the best, uh, the best action to undertake in that sense. Um, we were fearing that if we would engage everybody at the same time, for example, uh, we knew that the citizen association that at the beginning had defi defiance towards us. Uh, we didn't know if, if they would use the information to write an article in the paper, then the regional authority would mm, think, uh, what is this? So we had to be very careful with this. And the same with the industries. So we we feared also to, to, to have conflict with the interest in industries if they would know that we are engaging citizens. So uh, both from the side and the perspective of the regional authority and the industries, of course, for them, um, was uh, they had a lot of fear about us engaging the citizens. They would uh, think that uh, this would be worse. I mean, giving them a tool to map the others of the area uh, they would. Um, they, they were understanding this uh, uh, as something um, that could harm them a lot, instead of giving them data of the problem and building, strengthening the relationships, uh, being transparent, and, and all these things that I was explaining before. So I don't think there's there's um, like there's just uh, one choice. But uh, we thought that it was better to engage uh, the regional authority uh, as they uh, were also door openers uh, from us to the industries, to the Barcelona City Council, to other public institutions. And, and we thought uh, that was the best choice. And actually, I think it was. I mean, it, it has helped us a lot to have the regional authority on our side. I hope this uh, answers the question a bit. As this is a very interesting discussion anyway. Yeah, thanks, Nora. Yeah, I think it, the most important point is really that there is no right or wrong. It is different in each case and also in each of the pilot studies we we did, we adjusted to the local situation. So we did things differently. Um, some people were suggesting to go to the industry first. Some people were saying I would go to the industry last because they might 
um, you know, just do what they're told, but the bare minimum. Um, so that really, really depends on the situation. Uh, in Germany, for example, um, we were actually approached by the industry that were interested in, in um, contributing to the project and being a pilot case. So it, there is even that those cases where the industry is really willing to start more participatory approaches. Um, and then, you know, there are all these political issues. Sometimes the industry is linked with the municipality somehow. So there's really, it's a complex situation in each case. And so each case needs to be looked at uh, separately and, and uh, even within the pilot uh, study groups or leaders, we had discussions about what is the right approach to take. Um, so I think the, the most important thing is also, I think Louise, um, was the one who also mentioned that, or Hannah in, in the chat, that um, the, the important thing is that we're all, we're transparent from the beginning and we tell everyone, whoever we start with first, that everyone will be involved. And so it is a learning process as well um, of, of how we do it and how what's the best um, approach. Um, there was one more suggestion which we hadn't included. Irinma Ocho was asking, what about going to university um, first? So would that have been a, a possibility in Barcelona or is that generally maybe a possibility? What do you think, Nora or Lucia? Lucia's <laughs> signaling. <laughs> okay, no, yes, yeah, so I, I, can, I can answer. Um, well, the, the university, we tried to go to university, but the university, uh, at least at the first uh, step, like the, in, the, in the early uh, stage of the project, um they they well actually well we we couldn't um, engage them um it wasn't uh, really easy but uh at the end uh we actually we are working now with uh right now maybe you can answer too but uh we are doing uh with the university um the analysis relating with health um so this is really really um well important for for some of the SDGs that we are uh, trying to tackle also. Thank you, Lucia. Um, so Irinma followed up with a with a question asking, um, and I think Petra Benier also asked that question a bit earlier in the chat. Um, you know, how, how would you deal with the action part of the engagement model if you have both the industry and the affected communities? Um, together, so you know there there can be a lot of clashes and a lot of um, uh, difficulties in in getting them to talk to each other and to understand each other. So how how do you deal with it with the action part of the engagement model? Maybe Nora wants to answer that. Yeah, um, so we are actually in this part now. So we are uh, analyzing the data and we are trying to to get to the action phase. So I cannot answer like what happened because we are on it. I can tell you that uh, we are creating um, with many difficulties, actually, uh, even for, for COVID times, because our plan was to meet with the industries, uh, create these groups um, to correlate the data uh, gathered through the other collect app uh, with the industrial operations to look for improvements. So, you know, as a simple example, if you would have uh, some data that is uh, currently happening, some other observations currently happening uh, in the evening at seven, probably some uh, of the of the emitting industries, for instance, if the other would be uh, related to sludge, um, could happen that they have, for example, a door open and they are just um, doing operations with some trucks uh this is a this is a simple improvement uh that it could um improve also the the nuisance that the communities are facing so we are in this phase now and and our aim is to run uh co-creation encounters uh with the industry with the citizens and with the regional authority um and try to correlate this data and understand what's happening and look for improvements. Uh, we hope uh, we will get it. It's being a bit difficult because this is a new approach for the industry and they are quite afraid uh, about sharing data of the industrial operations 
but we are on it. Uh, we have the regional authority on our side, even if for them it's also difficult. But uh, yeah, we are trying our best. Thank you, Nora. Um, so at this point, I would like to just end the questions for now. We have um, more time at the end, or if we don't, we will, you know, move to Zoom and and we'll pick up all the questions there as well. So we can also answer face to face, and maybe you can you can ask more questions as well. Um, so Maria will tell us a lot about uh, the lessons learned and specific little stories about how we actually adjusted our methodology in the different situations. Maria, thank you, Simone. Hello, everyone. Um, well, you've learned about the methodology we are proposing to use in this project and you've actually heard how it has been implemented in a specific pilot, the Barcelona one. But we thought it would be interesting to also share all the stories from all the pilots and all the moments related to also how we had to change some of the things to be more inclusive. So. Uh, starting from a detailed and accurate stakeholder mapping, as Nora explained, which gives you information about who to engage and when and where to meet them, this is um, a crucial step when wanting to engage people in the, in the moment where citizen science occurs. So in our model, citizen science occur uh, or starts when we've got a research question and when we've got a hypothesis. For example, in Barcelona, where is the odor coming from? Or what um, type of odors are people perceiving as a, no as, an, as a nuisance? Once we've got that, that question, then citizen science starts and it finishes with the different action proposal that's generated a little bit or, or debate. So get your fishing rod ready because we're going to go a fish with a fish R. And the first picture you see here, you might recognize Nora and Lucia up on a stage and despite their amazing singing skills, they're not there to perform. This is actually in the neighborhood of La Mina. This is where Nora was explaining that the different uh, social issues were taken into account. And this is during the local festival. So during the local festival, you can meet and you can reach the community because they've gathered around the, the main activity. So what they did, they got up on the stage and then they started to explain the, the project so they could reach people and as not explained earlier another another interesting factor is like to if you want in if you're wanting to reach families for example you need to know where families are gathering in this case from five to six in the swimming pool while the kids you know enjoy the swimming lessons this is a, in the case of Thessaloniki we've got another pilot there which is dealing with a uh, river pollution and trying to use odors as a way to determine whether there is an episode of pollution in in the river and also to gather data about the refinery because a this is an issue that it's really bothering the the community so what happens here we're dealing with a community which is um, located in a low income area and the main networking or influencing uh, person or in like an institution is the church. So our pilot leader in Thessaloniki, they went to the church and they introduced the project and they they kind of got the uh, teamed up with the priest because he's the the influencer, the best influencer in the area, and they got the opportunity to meet the community through the church institution. So you need to be ready believe it or not, to go to these different places. Let's now take a walk to the other side of the world, not the other side, but a bit far, to Chile. In this case, in uh, this is the, the pilot in which a local community situated next to a wastewater treatment plant in Los Alamos, they've been complaining for years, but they couldn't recognize where the odors were coming from. So what a pilot leader did, and it's this gentleman here, Gerhard, which is a pilot leader in Chile, he took the neighbors to the other side of the fence and he showed or trained them. He showed the installations, he told them how the wastewater treatment plant worked and then also 
train them in recognizing the different odors that the industry could emit. So they spend a um, good day out in the field and this worked really well for people to be able to report more consistently because they would be able to recognize the odors. And also it created, um, before this, uh, this walk, the wastewater treatment plant was seen as a black box. It's like, okay, what's happening there? It, it smells, but I can't recognize what, it's, what specific smells mm, are coming from there, but also I don't know what's happening inside. So the fact that the doors were open and they went to the other side made the, the industry and the neighbors also, you know, start the conversation and then understanding each other because in with odor pollution issues, many of the problems uh, or many of the emitting industries are related to activities that are needed for um, our like, like normal activities like wastewater treatment plants, waste plants, etc. Uh, coming back to Europe, well, in this case, we're back to London. Sometimes you need to reach the people where, or team up with people who are already, you know, claiming for, for or campaigning against issues which are related to what you're trying to achieve in your project. So since 2016, there was a community in northeast London, northwest London, sorry, Louise, and they are claiming that there is like this gas work redevelopment is emitting some toxic air which is affecting the the quality of life and they think that that this wouldn't be happening in more affluent areas so the way they had to complain to the council was to use a telephone which is not always successful or easy so what we've done is we've teamed up with them and then we've offered ODA Collect as a way to gather real-time observations and then have the opportunity to collect um, evidence when going then to, to the council because people get tired of trying to reach the council on, on the phone and it's not really working. So sometimes it's about teaming up and supporting communities which can also be um, relevant to your own project. And speaking of using Odor Collect uh, and speaking of going where people are, this is a picture from our pilot in Porto. The waste facilities from Porto metropolitan area are located by the um, Tinto River. And the way this also by the river, there is a path that people use as a, on their day for, for a daily walks. And this path is used every year by 3,000 people. So in Porto, what we're trying to, to achieve is something similar to what we're doing in Thessaloniki, which is basically to understand or use odors as a way to identify the status of the river. So if you um, smelling something while walking along the path, you can report it and then the river keeper can actually go and check whether there is a uh, pollution episode in the river. So recently they've installed these uh, little, little signals with some information about odor collect and then try and engage people on their daily walks along the path by the river to use odor collect and to report if they see anything or if they can smell anything good or bad. Specifically, in this case, we're more interested in understanding the bad odors because it will give us an indication of how the river is uh, or what the situation with the river is. And now I want to change completely because I've been explaining how odor collect has been used and or promoted to actually um, contribute to other courses. And here, what we are doing, this is the Kampala pilot. And what you're seeing is a school kid writing something on a smell diary. So um, what happens in Kampala, it's with, we're dealing with an urban pilot and there are many sources of odors and many of those odor sources are even um, caused by the community themselves because people are burning rubbish and because they they using latrines inappropriately. So there is an opportunity to identify what the odors are from the community and then even make small changes themselves so they can avoid this um, nuisance. 
So here we've partnered up with kids and um, in Kampala in schools, school kids do not own phones, smartphones, and I'm not saying that any any kids should use smartphones. But the way to to overcome this is like, okay, what is the um, how can we collect meaningful data or what is the minimum information that we need to collect to make a data or to make a, an observation valid? And there are four things that we've identified, which is date, time, location, and type of odor. Just as you do with the odor collect app, but we translated it into a um, piece of paper that the kids could use together with a map of the area or with the help of, of an adult to indicate where the odor is happening. So here, um, and I think there was a question uh, earlier on the chat, how to digitize this. Here, what we're doing is like kids will gather the information or gather information on the smell diaries, and then the teachers will digitize that information and also teach them how to how to do that. So it's um, in Kampala, we're trying to also use this as a science uh, education in science and technology so kind of both things dealing with odor pollution issues but also engaging kids in this um science careers or science or and technology and you don't need to go that far or you deal with kids to encounter people who cannot use apps. And this is the case uh, that Simone's encountered in Germany with her pilot. Some of the people in the local pilot, which is also dealing with some uh, the river basing, they are really willing to participate and, and gather data, but they cannot use smartphones they really cannot uh, they simon tried on the phone to with the group to make them install the you know, the application the odor collect app but it was really really difficult so now what they do they've done they've decided to change to a pen and paper version so then once they collect the data they can send the data to to simon and she can digitize it unless there's like a community champion who wants to take over but this we'll, we'll see this with time and what happens when you've got a community already engaged, but then in times of a pandemic? So the pilot in San Juan de Madeira, which is in Portugal, a bit south from Porto, this is a very interesting location because they've been suffering from odor pollution for years. And the community has been well organized to um, campaign against it to the point that last year, the odor emitting industry, which is a um, it's called, uh, it's, a, they, it's a plant dealing with um, animal byproducts. So it's really, really mm, smelly. And it's located just in the neighboring um, municipality. So San Juan de Madeira neighbors suffer from the odors coming from the animal rendering plants coming from the neighboring village. And last year, the animal rendering plant implemented some um, improvements so it, it looks like the odor pollution issue is reduced has been reduced but this was implemented in autumn last year and the crucial months are some like spring and summer when the heat is you know the temperatures temperatures are higher and then the odor pollution um, issues are more present so this community was already engaged which is try to okay, monitor whether the solutions implemented by the, by the industry were actually effective. And there's, there had been some training with the community. There was a group of, of volunteers recruited and they have a mm, very, in, like they, they had designed a strategy to collect as many older observations during the summer as possible. But then in, during the pandemic, this, it was not possible for them to meet. It was not possible for them to organize activities together, like, like sensory walks or other types of activities. So that what they decided, the pilot leaders and the, and the community decided to do together was to create this Facebook group so they could encourage each other and share their experiences during times of, of uh, lockdown. And it's been quite interesting to see how a group of 50 members have been, you can see the report, like the odors reported in Odor Collect are 
the the odors reported in odor collect um have been continuous and maybe we'll see what happens after after the summer maybe the odor pollution issues has been partially resolved which would be a very um, interesting result of this pilot and i'm going to stop here and maybe i will give the floor to simon because i know there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, discussion going on in the chat. I can see here is like, woo -woo. so um, I don't know if we're going to go directly to the Zoom chat where we can actually invite our community champions to, put, so they can explain their own experience as um, engaged citizens. Simon? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would actually like to just uh, maybe ask one or two questions to you, Maria, before we move to Zoom. Um, okay. There was one question quite at the beginning that I think is fitting with, with those um, stories. Um, so Chris Bevelander asked um, that, you know, we mentioned that we build the theory of, of our um, engagement around the motivations of the, of the community. What kind of theory did you use? I'd say rather than a theory, it's more while building your stakeholder mapping, having in mind the potential motivations for, for all the stakeholders to engage in your project and also the potential barriers so you can anticipate uh, mitigation strategies. For example, and I, I remember one of the comments I think from Pedra earlier saying that people might fear to have the data available online in relation to odors because that might decrease the value of their properties. And this is absolutely true. So when you meet the community, you need to wear, be aware of that and then you need to be prepared. So um, I don't think we've used a specific um, motivation or theory around motivation, but maybe Luis could give some more information on the chat. Um, however, what we've done is like to be mindful of the different different motivations barriers and mitigation strategy for each of the stakeholders so because that will give you preparation when before going and meeting them or during the relationship you you might have with your stakeholders thanks maria yeah the second question i wanted to ask or, or more you know the discussion that's going on is uh has to do with that second point that you mentioned, you know, the negative impacts on potential pricing of the houses and things like that. Mm. Um, so there was also the discussion about um, uh, the industries potentially being able, being aggressive towards the citizens and what does it actually help the citizens to do, to gather data in such an open, an open way. And so mm. Louise was answering in the chat as well that, you know, that there are reporting procedures that are often used um, using the phone. I know that's the case in the UA, it's in the UK, it's the case in, in Germany as well, uh, where people make complaints um, via the phone, they call the municipality, and that basically makes their uh, complaints in, invisible. And so what Dino's is also tries to do is basically make those visible. And you maybe also elaborate a bit on that, how that is done and why are these complaints invisible if, if they don't actually use an open uh, an open way to do it so where everyone can access and mm -hmm. what are the pitfalls you know with the industry as well knowing that citizens are actually gathering data. Mm. So maybe to clarify sometimes we might uh, want to actually keep the data um, not invisible but maybe private if we have a good collaboration between the industry for example and the um, community and they want, and, and also the, the regulatory body or the local administration, if they all on board and they want to, okay, let's analyze the information first and let's see what happens. Maybe the decision, the collective decision is to keep that data a little bit hidden while I'm trying to understand when is the, when is the, when are the orders emitted and being emitted? And what was the industry doing, like doing at that time, which is the most difficult information to get, to be honest. But maybe that, you know, we might decide, it hasn't happened yet, but we might decide in a pilot to actually keep the information a little bit private. But what I think what, what might uh, benefit uh, to like 
the the um, benefit the, yeah the benefit of public like having the data publicly accessible would be that maybe other neighbors will join as well and will feel empowered by you know all the data visible and also it will maybe highlight the fact that there is an issue happening in an area so maybe the a community which hasn't been heard earlier might be heard now because there's like you know 50 people saying that something is happening here and it's not just you going to the city council taking the time to report taking the time to wait on the phone until someone picks up and then get to to the night to the person so this is what what people in the uk were saying in the in the uk pilot is like we with we don't have enough power because a lot of people just give up they can they cannot be bothered with the official you know complaint channels that they're giving us so we want to get gather evidence even if it's not official but to start making a case yeah thanks maria i think uh louise also mentioned in the chat um in answer to that that it's kind of a black box so as you said you know you you don't really know if your neighbors are also complaining are you the only one suffering uh, you know is it just me calling the municipality all the time is someone else as well why why are they not doing anything and I think often also the complaints actually get lost. So I know this is the case in Germany. I tried for quite a while to figure out um, where are there areas where people complain a lot. And there are actually no databases. There is no, uh, no protocol of how you gather complaints. Um, and I think that is throughout Europe. I don't know of any specific protocols. There are some municipalities who have their own protocols, but there's nothing really, no big database. And so also the municipality I'm working with in Germany People complain by phone and there's this basically one person who picks up the phone and then just remembers the people and he knows the place really well, but there's no nothing written how often people complain when and where. So I think that is also a way that it's it's being lost. So if you if we use denoses and and the tools, we can actually make that visible and make sure that it stays there, it doesn't actually get lost. Okay, I think we are um, in the time. So if I can get all the speakers back on, please just quickly. Uh, okay, I'll just uh, move on while they come. <laughs> so I would just like to thank uh, thank you all for um, for your contributions, for presenting the Dinos' methodology. And thanks to everyone for such a lively discussion in the chat as well. I was trying to, to monitor a little bit as well, and we got all the, the important questions posted in, in, in our chat. Um, so there was a lot going on. I think um, you know there'll be more discussions. So we will move to the Zoom channel. So if you feel like uh, asking more questions or um, just chatting to us, and if you would like to be here from Silvina, who's our community champion in Barcelona, she will um, tell you a bit about her story, how she got involved, why she got involved. Um, so yes, I would like to thank everyone for joining and hope to see you over at the Zoom. Uh, in a second. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.